Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. We welcome you to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast. I'm Trent Kling. A big thanks to those behind the scenes helping make the show work every week. This week, we've got a great interview. As always, we're going to talk with Danny Cushion, the CMO at Cardletics, about their latest state of spend report. Additionally, they've got some back-to-school numbers that they wanted to share as well. You're looking at numbers from a huge amount of transactions in the United States. So we'll talk about not only back-to-school, some of the state of spend numbers, but also areas of the country where retail spend might not be down as much as one might think, as well as different categories that are doing pretty well for retailers as we head into mid-September. We'll also discuss a couple of big stories on the horizon, one with Home Depot and one with Buy Below, but we start with news surrounding JCPenney and their attempt to come out of bankruptcy. A quick reminder, you can like us and rate us however you access us, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, which is how the majority of people access us. We're also on Amazon. You can simply tell Alexa that you'd like to listen to the Retail Focus podcast and listen there. Additionally, Spotify or any other podcast listening service. Also, you can check us out on social media at Retail Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. So it appears that REITs have once again come to save the day for a bankrupt retailer as Simon and Brookfield once again team up as they seek to acquire JCPenney, or at least the retail side of JCPenney, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, we've heard a lot of rumors over the past few months about potential suitors for JCPenney, including Amazon, but the most likely suspects have emerged as the prominent stalking horse bidders, the most likely suspects being these REITs. Other interested parties included notorious private equity firm Sycamore Partners and Hudson's Bay, according to news reports. And just last week, it was announced that a group of lenders was willing to take over the company if a buyer couldn't be found. So lenders to JCPenney, if a buyer could not be found in the bankruptcy proceedings, at least for the moment, that's been put on hold. Now, we should mention as a caveat that nothing is final until the bankruptcy court signs off on it. I think that little caveat was missing from a few of the news stories this week. So this is merely the proposed deal. Pre-COVID, we saw a number of creditors towards bankrupt retailers be rather bullish about companies liquidation actually rather than continuing as a company in order to reclaim assets this was certainly the case in the circumstance of sears holdings bankruptcy proceedings you recall a few creditors there certainly clamoring for liquidation to try and reclaim some of those assets but that happened in a few other bankruptcies in retail as well but Due to the noted difficulty of liquidation in the current climate, it's hard to imagine creditors angling for liquidation all that much. And as will be seen, the first lien holders and the other creditors seem rather set on JCPenney's survival. So honestly, when you look at liquidation, that really hasn't been a serious topic of conversation surrounding this bankruptcy from the beginning. And Honestly, it's more likely that the stalking horse bid in this case is outdone by another bid in the auction process, although even the likelihood of that we see as being fairly slim. Now, let's talk about the proposed deal. It was released in a presser on Wednesday of this last week. The proposal from the two REITs would see JCPenney split into two separate entities, Opco and Propco's. Opco would be held by Brookfield and Simon. That Part of the company, interestingly enough, would include JCPenney's retail and operating assets. Basically, there you're looking at the retail operations. The bid for Opco is set at $1.75 billion, and that's in a combination of cash and new term loan debt. The interesting part of it, and I think it's just interesting when you consider what Simon and Brookfield are, which is REITs, is that this Propco's would hold 161 of JCPenney's current real estate assets and all of JCPenney's owned distribution centers. Propco's would function as a REIT, but rather than being held by Brookfield and Simon, it would be held by the company's first lien lenders. 
Further, Opco and Propcos would be tethered together by a master lease agreement for the properties that are moved to Propcos. This is important in this case without going too far down the master lease rabbit hole because they mean a number of different things depending on which sector you're looking at. The agreement that's in place would allow JCPenney to sublet the properties to tenants on an as-needed basis. So you look at those 161 stores. Currently, JCPenney owns those locations. If JCPenney were to want to shut down one of those stores, in the past they might be looking at certainly leasing out those properties or selling off those properties. This master lease agreement that's proposed in this stalking horse bid would actually retain JCPenney's ability to drive income from those properties. Now, granted, would it be as much income as if they were just leasing it out straight up? No, but they can still drive a little bit of income if they should need to close some of those stores and sublet those stores out. So that's an important facet of this deal is that JCPenney isn't just giving up wholeheartedly these properties to the first lien holders. Rather, there's still a way for JCPenney to drive some income from those properties. They're not necessarily mortgaging their entire future as far as this real estate is concerned if this deal happens to go through. Now, this being said, this offer is still in the process of being submitted to the appropriate branch of U.S. Bankruptcy Court. From here, the process should entail JCPenney going to auction any proposed bid at that auction would need to beat out this stocking horse deal in order to earn consideration. So basically, they're coming into the auction, the idea is, with this stocking horse deal in hand. $1.75 billion for just the retail operations is a pretty significant number. The company said in their press release that they expect the auction to be complete, and one way or the other, they expect proceedings to essentially be done and for JCPenney to be operational under its own umbrella by the 2020 holiday season at the latest, although we've seen delays in the process so far, so this might be just a touch optimistic. Now, CEO Jill Soltow, as we expected, spoke glowingly of the offer. That's usually the case when the company issues a press release about a stalking horse bid, but she said that it speaks to JCPenney's value as a company. Actually, strength was the term that she used, that it was able to garner such a significant stalking horse bid amongst other interests. And she basically said, hey, that really speaks to the brand and what we've built over the last 120 years or so, that there have been so many rumors surrounding this particular bankruptcy deal. And of course, this isn't the first time Simon and Brookfield have teamed up. Their acquisition of Aeropostal a few years ago has been pointed to as a successful circumstance of a REIT or REITs, in this case, saving a retailer. Aeropostal has been able to bounce back somewhat. Granted, this is according to Simon and Brookfield's numbers themselves, but you look at the number of closings, certainly not the number that a lot of people envisioned for Aeropostal. Most recently, these two companies set their sights on Forever 21 and bought that company, although it's too early to tell whether that deal will work out. We're still in kind of the early days of them taking over the operations of Forever 21. But if nothing else, their goal of retaining tenants to make malls seem more attractive to both visitors and potential renters has been at least mildly successful to this point. There have been other circumstances, certainly with maybe less well-known retailers where REITs have stepped up to purchase the retailers out. Now, we've discussed in the past that you know, Simon isn't going to be the strongest retail REIT out there. I think there are a lot of other REITs, Kimco among them, that are seeing a heightened level of success in terms of occupancy, in terms of people actually paying their rent. But they've certainly fared better than the likes of CBL. And even in the midst of the pandemic, as of June 30th of this year, Simon had 92.9% occupancy in its properties and saw a year-over-year -year increase in the base minimum rent per square foot of 2.8%. Now, those numbers are all well and good, but they're also not seeing a tremendous amount of the retailers they rent out to actually paying rent during this time, especially in California locations where government has forced closures really since about July 15th. 
Overall, though, the most important takeaway here is that while a lot is yet to be finished off on this deal, things look much better for JCPenney now than, say, a few weeks ago. There were a number of negative headlines certainly touting closures, and yes, they will close some stores, but a number of headlines also questioning the future of JCPenney after the bankruptcy court judge expressed some impatience with the whole dealings on JCPenney's end, and it's clear that at least a few entities are willing to take on the task of guiding JCPenney back to profitability. I think it was a great sign when they had a number of lenders step up and say, hey, look, we'll run the company. We would rather avoid liquidation on this front. So that was the first great sign, and that was about a week ago that that happened, and now you get this stalking horse bid that's been solidified. We've argued multiple times on the show, JCPenney is often the last retailer in struggling C-class malls, and if this bankruptcy allows them to right-size their store portfolio, unlock value in some of the real estate they hold through the use of the master lease clause, this could be a significant win for them. It's hard to imagine the company not emerging from bankruptcy with a much cleaner slate, and overall, I think proceedings have gone better than a lot of people have expected, at least to this point. There's still a lot to be done here, including the bankruptcy auction, so we could see some adventures coming up. We hold our breath regarding that, but overall, it seems like it's a good sign for the legacy retailer, at least as good a sign as one can have if they're in bankruptcy. Well, that's the end of the news portion of the podcast. Coming up after this break, we're going to be joined by Danny Cushion, the CMO at Cardlytics. Again, we're going to look at purchase data throughout the U.S. to talk a little bit about the U.S.'s current state of spend, not only in retail, but in other areas as well. We're also going to talk about the potential for holiday sales moving up a little bit. We've talked about holiday sales flattening with Danny in the past, but the movement of Prime Day could have a more significant impact on the macro than it's had in previous years. We're at a point where we're somewhat in between shopping seasons. We just got through a very different back to school campaign and now shifting our focus towards a holiday shopping season that could be unlike any other. So it's a perfect time to revisit the data. And to that end, we're pleased to be joined by Danny Cushion, the CMO at Cardlytics. Danny, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Trent. Always a pleasure to be on here. Now, I know we always start our chats with this, but we've added a lot of new listeners in the past few months. Do you mind giving us kind of a refresher of what Cardlytics does and where the data we'll discuss today comes from? Yep, not at all. So Cardlytics is a company, we're an advertising platform that runs our ads in some of the largest banks in the world. And what I mean by that is we work with a number of banks like Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, a bunch of others to present cashback rewards to folks who are using their mobile apps and their online banking with those banks. So if you're a Chase customer, you actually open up your mobile app, you go and manage your money, you're thinking about all the great things that Chase does for you, and you see some ads in there. But we are the company that runs that technology and brings those advertisers in front of bank customers. So that is really what we do. We're at the simplest level ads in banks. But the reason that is so successful and that it's really, really impactful to help advertisers drive sales is that all of the targeting that we do is based upon past purchase history. And so for us to be able to present the right rewards ad in front of a consumer, we aggregate the bank's data, so debit, credit, ACH, bill pay, and it's all anonymized, so we don't know anything about anybody except you know being able to look at spend patterns. And that allows us to present the right cashback rewards that we know would be relevant and interesting and valuable for you. What you get is different than what I get, than different what my husband gets, than different what my mom gets. So as a result of that, since we are are running this program for the banks to help them provide a great cashback reward program for their customers, we spend a lot of time digging into and analyzing trends with the spend data that we have. And that's actually where we work with the advertisers who are presenting these ads to bank consumers, we look at what does spend data look like. And so at the simplest level, we crunch numbers every which way to Sunday. We've got a lot of data scientists and very, very smart analytical people and a bunch of machine learning that puts 
looking at $3 trillion in spend data is somewhat simpler than if you were just having people do it. But we use this to identify how consumers are actually spending. And it's been an incredibly valuable and powerful way for the marketers that we work with to be able to better understand where people are shopping when they're not shopping with them, and then to be able to present ads to consumers that they know are the most likely buyers for them. And so we're all about trying to drive you know, share capture, right? share shift, and to be able to help people make a purchase decision when they're actively thinking about their money. So that is the basis of these state of spend reports that we put out, this the data-driven research, because it tells some really interesting stories about where consumers are spending their money. So let's talk about those state of spend reports. I know Cardlytics has been releasing these with regularity this year. What did we see in the latest state of spend report that covered towards the end of summer? Yep, it's a great question. We've put out seven so far. We'll be putting out our eighth issue at the end of this month. What we've been looking at is to see how has Consumer spend at the macro level been going. We actually we started this right after the pandemic. It's been something that we've been looking at and doing with our advertisers for a long time. But there was just such a demand and desire to look at really what's happening with consumer spend right now. We've been doing this since March. In the latest issue, we go through middle of August. And actually, I have some more recent data that I'll talk to you about today. But at the highest level, consumer spend overall through the end of August is down about 3.6% year over year. And so that's actually not bad. It's actually gotten to a pretty flat level. When the pandemic first started back in March, it was down, you know, immediately it was down about 34% year over year. And that's spend across all categories. That's not just retail. And so I think what you see from the latest report that we've put out, there's been some pretty nice recovery going. The one caveat that that I'll give to that, though, that down 3.6% in year-over-year spend is pretty well normalized by a lot of online spend that's occurred over the summer. If you think about the categories that have really been rising in spend, like streaming, like online delivery, like online grocery, which has just been going gangbusters, and I can't even tell you how many stories of how many millions of consumers that have never made an online grocery purchase have made one in the past, you know, five, six months. So we also look at what we call the recovery leading indicator, the RLI. So the recovery leading indicator, it doesn't just look at overall spend. It actually specifically looks at categories that might indicate that consumer spend is going to be coming back in person or in store. So it looks at things like salons. It looks at things like, you know, fast casual dining. It looks at things like the in-store locations of apparel retailers. And that, there's some good news there too, to be honest. While the year-over-year number is actually down about 20% year-over-year, so clearly lower than the the broader 3.5%, Negative 20% year over year is the best number that we have seen since March. You know, immediately that number was about 75% down year over year. And so, again, that's heavily retail and restaurant. And what that indicates is spend is coming back. It's still depressed. It is still depressed. And there's still some major winners on the online side. But the folks who are actually starting to open up locations safely, who are really figuring out how to make the most of their omni-channel marketing strategies and shopping strategies, spend is starting to come back. And while we don't go into this in the report, it's quite closely tied, as you can imagine, to how the virus is doing through the country, right? And so where there are places where there have been spikes, spend typically depresses again. And so it's just, it's the long game, but that is the most recent data that we've put out at the highest level. And I was going to ask you about that as well, because this indicator, you do break it down on a state-by-state basis. Where are some of the areas that have maybe been hit hardest towards the end of summer, and where are the areas that are seeing the most success on the retail front towards the end of summer? Yep, it's a great question. You know, listen, the national monthly average of, you know, about 20 to 25% down for the recovery leading indicator There are actually 37 states, which are pretty good majority, that actually tracked higher than that through the end of the summer. You know, when you look deep into certain individual states, consumers' confidence is still fluctuating. You think about what's happened through Memorial Day, 
folks were actually, well, general like air travel and hospitality is down. But what we are looking at is things like auto parts, you know, and DIY home services, things like that. You can imagine that those are going crazy. And so there are actually some categories that have actually really helped recover this. I think what you see from a, a state by state or region by region perspective, there's some really pretty good growth in states like New York, which is up about 15 points. There are Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Michigan, some of these places where they were severely depressed earlier in the summer are now have been able to actually come out and, you know, consumers are having a bit more confidence to come out. Stores are open in a safe way and you can actually start to see spend coming back. The reason I think that's important for retailers, though, too, is just to really target and think about marketing campaign strategies based upon when people are ready to shop again. And that's a lot how we use our data and our platform to work with advertisers is to help marketers make informed decisions about where to run marketing campaigns, when to reintroduce in-store messaging, when to really amp up omni-channel and online messaging. So that's really, you know, the what's what of why that matters. Yeah, it's never been more important, you could say, to localize those advertisements and the ad spend and the ad campaigns that retailers are doing. I did want to ask you, because we, we talk about this discretionary spend being down you know, in the double-digit percentage, but spending overall, as you mentioned, is only off about 3% year over year. So what are some of those non-discretionary categories that we're seeing people really funnel money towards? Yeah, it's a great question, and it is online in a huge way. And Well, the, there are a couple of anomalies that I'll talk about. There are some categories that I said, like home improvement. I mean, uh, huge numbers, you know, through the summer in particular, as people pick up home improvement projects. I know we've got a few going. Most people I've talked to have a few going. You know, there are some categories where that has gone really well. What's driving a lot of that are things like streaming, are things like online beauty and cosmetics. There's a fair bit of growth in there in categories like online grocery delivery, you know, online grocery orders and delivery. And I think, interestingly, even things like restaurant delivery are a huge driver of that. So if we look at, you know, despite the fact that I think the last report we were looking at, full-service restaurant was only down about 27% year over year. Now, that's the best we've seen since March. So that's improving but if you look at restaurant delivery, you know, the delivery spend through July, August, consumers spent over $180 million more on delivery than they spent in the entire year of 2019. <laughs> so you, you can picture it, right? You get sick of cooking. You know, you're either ordering groceries online and getting them delivered or picking them up, or you just want to get stuff from your favorite restaurant. There are categories like that that have made a big boost in the overall number. There have been some other categories, which I know we'll talk about in a minute here, that also really drove a pretty good boost with back-to-school shopping, much of which was online, as you can imagine. So let's talk about back-to-school. What were some of the trends you were seeing in terms of breaking down the back-to-school spend, not only just in the aggregate, but what were some categories that were leading the way? Yeah, back to school was interesting this year, right? So, you know, in the past, what, since 2016? And keep me honest on that, but We've had Amazon Prime Day, right, pulling a lot of back-to-school spend forward. Super different year this year, clearly stating the obvious. I know my kids are back in school in person, but most people I know, their kids are doing virtual learning. And it's a very different year for back-to-school. And so, A, without Prime Day happening in the July-August time frame as it typically has, and I know we'll talk about that in a minute, too, on what that might, that might do for holiday, Back to school spend, it was decent. It was decent. I think where we really saw some categories doing very, very well in early to mid-August were a lot of specialty retailers. So apparel was up 3.5% week over week from late July to August, and that's a decent bump. Books up, home decor up, you know, technology up. But I think the most interesting thing is online education and office supplies the year-over-year -year increases in August, in a part of August, online education was up 132%, office supplies up 100% year-over-year. -year. So you can imagine exactly what's going on, but there was some really interesting growth for people who were preparing to get their kids set up to do school from home. 
I think one of the other numbers I saw is that salons were up week over week 6%. So people starting to get those back to school haircuts, trim up those quarantine haircuts, if you will. You mentioned it. Prime Day is moving, reportedly going to be in early October again. And other than just obviously seeing the chunk of Amazon Prime Day sales moving there, what are some other some interesting macro level impacts that we might see overall? I was wondering if you could kind of dig into what might happen when we shift those Prime Day numbers. Yeah, this has been a pretty interesting trend that we have seen and worked with a lot of our retail advertisers on over the last few years. At the most basic level, again, like our mantra and just based on the data we see, you know, we believe that past purchase history and activity really helps to predict future purchase activity. And that does not change during a pandemic. So what we've seen in past years, once Amazon Prime Day was introduced in late July back in, again, I think it was 2016, Back to school spend used to really occur in late August, early September. That's when we saw the boost in spend. Once Amazon Prime Day was introduced and it started to get traction, it absolutely pulled back to school spend. And again, remember back to school as a shopping holiday, number two in the whole year. So holiday first, back to school second. The impact that Amazon Prime Day had, what's the saying, a rising tide raises all boats. True, absolutely true. And it pulled consumer shopping forward to such an extent that the smart marketers who actually really had a finger on the pulse and that, you know, were running advertising campaigns with us earlier to take advantage of the rise in spend would do very, very well. And so the impact of what we anticipate for the holidays here is, and a holiday spend has actually been, there used to be a huge boost over Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and it's still pretty big. It's still a pretty good jump. But what we've seen in the past few years is a general like flattening out of the holiday shopping period. I think we put out a piece last year that we entitled Orange is the New Black Friday. And we were seeing holiday shopping even coming as early as Halloween, mid-October. I think what we're going to see, it's going to be earlier. If we can learn from what Amazon Prime Day has done and its impacts back to school, I think the marketers who can put promotions out and really get their advertising campaigns targeted to people who are ready to shop, you know, and again, we're we're doing that based on people who are actively spending in a category. Those that take advantage of the early shopping behavior that Prime Day is likely going to drive, they're going to get a really good boost on the holiday sales that they need to drive so that it doesn't become wholly dependent on Black Friday, doesn't become so heavily dependent on Cyber Monday. Holiday spend is it is pretty spread out, but I think it's going to be super interesting to see what happens to how many people are actually starting to do early holiday shopping because they know that they're going to get the deal. And that brings us to this, and I kind of wanted to close on this because, again, you mentioned at the beginning, Cardlytics helps a, a number of retailers in terms of marketing, in terms of analytics. Where do you think we're going to see the biggest shift in terms of those marketing dollars being spent outside of, you know, again, retailers maybe spending those marketing dollars a bit earlier to try and capitalize on some of that holiday spend shifting earlier? You know, I think so the when is a big one. I also think the how and how marketers are using their targeting in a smart way earlier is incredibly important. And then the what you promote is incredibly important in this time frame. So again, if you don't have your omni-channel strategy in order and are ready to talk about it, like go, 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 go. I always think about this as the, the, what is the Brady Bunch, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. It's like omni, omni, omni. I'm not answering the where they're going to market, but you absolutely must look at the fact that online spend is and will continue to be through the roof. So being really smart about driving people to your online experience is crucial. And then frankly, I think as retailers are opening up in-store locations, being able to talk about the fact that it's done in a safe way, communicating when you open locations back up, I think that's going to be of paramount importance as well because folks are slowly coming out. There are going to be ebbs and flows to this whole stupid thing. But I think being able to communicate that you're there for your shoppers however they want to buy continues to be a recurring trend that we talk about on this podcast. But it's really just about marketing to the way that people are ready to shop. And that is no different. It's just changed slightly in making sure that you're conscious of what your consumers want. 
Well, as always, fantastic insight with plenty of transaction data to back it up. Danny Cushion, the CMO at Cardlytics. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. Well, we thank Danny for joining us here on the show and something actually to keep in mind while we're on the topic of some of the things that we were discussing, especially as it pertains to Black Friday and holiday deals. Home Depot actually announced this last week where they're extending their Black Friday deals for a total of two months. So you're going to see those deals pop out in Home Depot stores beginning in October. So Black Friday sales will go a little bit earlier for them. Target, Best Buy, Macy's, all among retailers who have said to this point they expect the holiday season growing Maybe not indicating growing as much in terms of lengthening as what Danny was talking about. But again, you're looking at purchase data, which suggests that not only is Prime Day a big day for Amazon, but certainly other retailers in terms of driving the overall spend. You'd have to imagine if Home Depot is doing this, you're going to see the same thing at Lowe's. You're going to see the same thing at Ace. You're going to see everyone kind of keep up with the Joneses. It only takes really one retailer to make that splash. And changes happen a lot more quickly now than they used to. It wasn't, but you know, maybe 20 years ago that it was considered really cutting edge for a retailer to be open during Thanksgiving. It only took a few years for retailers then to all open up during Thanksgiving. We're starting to see some pushback on that now in 2020. But at the same time, because news travels so quickly now compared to what it did, say, in the year 2000, You're going to see, I think, a lot more retailers hop on this train where they try to get out in front of the Black Friday sales and try to join Prime Day, if you will, and just extend their holiday sales through the end of the year. So interesting things. And once again, we appreciate Danny for joining us here on the show. Our looking ahead story this week has to do with Five Below. CEO Joel Anderson appeared on CNBC this week to discuss what was for them a robust Back to school season, a little bit of background regarding Anderson. He was a former Walmart.com CEO, although some analysts, to be fair, didn't feel as though his tenure was especially notable. Nonetheless, he appeared on CNBC this week to discuss their back to school season. And he said, hey, it is a substantial shopping shift, not only in how customers are shopping, but what they're buying. You're seeing that shift away from backpacks and pencils. Office supplies, as Danny Cushion said, still up a little bit, but what they've seen is more momentum surrounding the room category and the at-home category. And you look at Five Below, they're kind of in this perfect position in the marketplace because, again, as you start to see some potential buying habits that suggest recessionary buying habits from the purchasing public, although not as wholesale as maybe what we thought we would see to this point, Five below with their lower price point is going to be in a pretty good position. Additionally, you look at the position they hold in the marketplace in the minds of preteens. It's a very good sign for five below that people are coming. They are shopping at the stores and they are shopping in different what they call worlds at five below. So rather than selling pencils and pencil cases and some of the other back to school things, backpacks and whatnot, they're selling these items that are oftentimes higher priced and have a little bit higher margins. So again, you're looking at benefits there. However, the reason we're looking ahead is because one thing he mentioned on the call is the Halloween season. How will it impact not only five below sales, but everyone else's sales? Because you're seeing a number of legislative endeavors that are really designed to curtail trick-or-treating in the United States. Now, what Anderson said on this particular interview is that you're seeing a shift to more of a focus about decor, and they've updated their merchandising and their buying to reflect that. He said, and I quote, it's about still creating a fun experience at home, end quote. Are other retailers going to find that this is what's going to happen? Are there going to be forms of 
safe trick-or-treating that will be allowed in the U.S.? Where will we see candy sales for those companies that are notable for selling candy? And more importantly, if kids aren't going out for trick-or-treating, are there going to be costumes at all? How are people going to approach that facet? And these pop-up shops, the spirit Halloweens of the world, the Halloween Expresses of the world, how are they going to perform? Now, we're already seeing some of these shops pop up throughout the country. And of course, if you've got empty retail real estate near you, you've probably seen the Spirit Halloweens of the world already step up to fill some of those spaces. This is a huge make or break season for those seasonal type retailers because obviously this is their main revenue driver. So if Spirit Halloween can't drive the traffic that they once could through the likes of costumes and other things around the house, can they make sure that their merchandise mix is appropriate to what people might be doing in order to celebrate Halloween? Will they be able to update their merchandise mix towards decor and other things? Or will other companies take over in that space? Or will people just try to spend the least amount they can on Halloween? Will they try to save money on Halloween if there's no trick-or-treating or anything like that and chalk it up as a lost year for that? So a lot to be decided here, but it's a fairly significant seasonal category for many retailers. And if they can't bring in the seasonal sales like it appears Five Below is bringing in, that could mean trouble, especially for some of those pop-up stores. So that's our looking ahead story for this week. Once again, a big thanks to Danny Cushion for joining us. A big thanks to Leighton and Lindsay behind the scenes helping make the show run. I'm Trent Kling saying so long until next week. We've got a couple of great interviews lined up next week. We're going to jump off of our recent discussion about 3D imaging and retail websites to discuss how 3D images are used in an AR context for retail companies and stepping away from app-based developments towards browser-based developments. That's an interesting conversation. We'll also talk to the co-founders of Truff. Truff is a, a kind of a luxury or premium hot sauce brand about the process they undertook in getting that product into the shelves of retail stores throughout the country. Coming up over the next few weeks, we're also going to talk about retail direct from farms. That's an area that a lot of people don't talk about. There's a lot of interesting facets to that. And a couple of weeks from now, we're going to talk to a manager at a grocery co-op to talk about operations there, how that co-op structure works, and also the importance of bringing natural and organic foods to mid-sized markets in the U.S. So lots of great interviews coming up on deck for the next two weeks. We're certainly excited about it, and we hope you will tune in for those podcasts. Until the next show, so long. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.